You're listening to Tarazi Tuesdays with the Bible is Literature. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos, and you are listening to Tarazi Tuesdays with the Bible as Literature podcast. This week, Father Paul continues his discussion of the Toledot of Shem, noting that Abraham does not have a Toledot in Scripture, but is instead placed within the Toledot of Terah. I am happy to introduce Father Paul on the Bible as Literature podcast, Tarazi Tuesdays. Now, Heran is very interesting for the following reasons. That Heran, the name of one of the sons of Tera, is with a He. He, Haran, Haran. Whereas the area of Aram is with a Het, Haran. Okay, we have to make sure that we hear them differently. But in English, you have H-A-R-A-N. You can't figure out the difference. Now, the sun is Haran, and it is based on the root Har, which is mountain, with the ending N, which is specifically a suffix of profession or attribution. And thus, Haran would be the mountaineer. And when you hear it, you... I mean, you should not miss the connection with the city and the tower that was destroyed by God. So here we hear that Heran disappears before the family of Terah moves from Ur into Haran and then into Canaan. I mean, he's completely, totally eliminated in a few short verses, which reminds you of how God eliminated the plan of the people who wanted to build a city and a tower in the area of Ur, Mesopotamia, and it was eliminated. And the future will lie in the area of Haran, which is from the root That means hot, hotness, we still have it in Arabic, har, and obviously in scriptural Hebrew, and it is obviously the area of the Syrian wilderness, which brings life in spite of its hotness around the oasis Tadmor. And Haran is very important. We will see later how both Isaac and Jacob go to get married with their family, which is in Haran. So I need to expand now because we are here at the junction of the beginning of the typically biblical story of that progeny of Abram, Abraham, and the author is already saying the whole story as I said time and again and again and again, that it is said so many times already in Genesis 1 through 11 that I concluded, it's not that I forced it upon the text, that really the author is saying the story time and again and again and again and again. So that when you start to hear specifically about Abram, Abraham and his progeny, you are prepared to expect to be fooled by God. You never know how. In each new story, he fools you differently. (laughs) And thus, the Bible is telling you that you shall never be in control. It is impossible. And with this, we enter the exceptional story of Abraham. Abraham, 
we have to notice first and foremost that Abram or Abraham does not have a Toledot in Scripture. We'll talk about it later. You hear only the Toledot of Terah, and it goes on until you hear the following time the Toledot of Ishmael, and then Isaac, and then Esau, and then Jacob. Okay, so Abraham in the Bible is within the Toledot of Terah. And that also is important because if you recall the meaning of Terah, you will realize that it is reflected not in the fact that one of his sons died early, the mighty one, the mountaineer, but here also you expect that Abram and Sarai, notice, after you have been fooled because she's barren, that God gives him the promise and you get excited to hear only positive stuff and you are going to be hit again and again and again with negative stuff. I'm going to mention them quickly and I'll wrap up. Abram resort to Egypt for food and he is forced to lie about Sarai. Abraham's feud with Lot, his nephew. The mistreatment of Hagar by Sarai, although Hagar gave a progeny to Sarai's husband. After the covenant, when the Lord asked Abraham to walk before me and be blameless, both Abraham and Sarah laughed at God's promise. And then Abraham's Shameless bargaining with God concerning God's justice in the episode was Sodom. That's the greatest slap in his face. He's arguing with God whether God is just or not. And then we have the death punishment of the disobedient wife of Lot. Remember, Lot is the nephew of Abraham, which ended with Lot lying with his daughters to secure a progeny. Then we have a repeat of the experience with Pharaoh in the story of Abraham and Abimelech, where again he lies about his wife. And we have, last but not least, the casting out of Hagar and her son by Sarah. So, it's a sad story, but you are caught already. Because at the beginning of chapter 12, in verse 3, you have God's promise that his blessing will be enacted to all the families, mishpachot, of the earth. Chapter 10, all the families of the earth through Abram, meaning through God's handling of Abram. This Toledot of Shem is really very powerful, central, important, and holds Genesis 1 through 11 with the rest of the biblical story. And let us not forget that Shem means name. It is the name. We are ultimately, if you hear it in Hebrew, the children, the progeny of the name, who's going to be very clearly presented as God himself, Hashem, the name. Now, let's go back to Cain and Lamech that are mentioned in chapter 4 and how they are picked up in the Toledot of Adam. Cain is nowhere to be found except indirectly through Canaan. But Henoch is found, although he's presented negatively in the progeny of Cain, he is transformed into the real meaning of his name. 
Lamech, on the other hand, remains in the same function. But then he is kept so that the hearer would understand that kings are not divine. They do not live for 10,000 of years and so on. You remember we talked about the king lists. But Lamech is someone who is born and who dies. So it's the functionality of each passage on its own grounds. And only then you make the connection. Remember what I said earlier about Peleg and Yoktan. Peleg is number one, Yoktan number two. Suddenly the author speaks about Yoktan. He is free. He says whatever he wants. Our trouble, unfortunately, is that we are used to hear the names as being individuals. Hence comes our question, what happened? How could someone who was the father could be the son? And the, it doesn't matter. The original people heard, and that's how I hear it in Arabic. It's functional. Notice in the tradition of the Arabs, where the name continues, the son who has a son calls his son about the name of the grandfather and so on. And you have Joseph, son of Jacob, son of Joseph, son of Jacob, and so on. This is a way to tell you that you have a continuity here. Obviously, the third Jacob is not like the first Jacob. But then that's not how the text functions. That's how I deal in the part of my book about the New Testament. Let me take this aside. Suddenly in the New Testament, we like to speak about James or in French, Jacques. So we imagine you have a different name and thus a different person. But in the original Greek, it's Yaakovos. But Yaakovos is the Gracicide form of Iakov which is the Septuagint transliteration of Jacob. So James is Jacob. He is the head of the Jerusalemite leadership, as I explain in my book. That is how we have to approach Eber. But then in both cases, the original meaning of his name is very important. He is Eber, the one who crosses. And thus, it's clearly shepherdism. He is clearly linked with Shem already in chapter 10. And that is why I underscore his importance. He doesn't shift in his function. He is the father of all the Abarim, the plural of Ebri, that is Eber. My invitation to the general hearers would be to deal with the genealogy of Shem in chapter 10. Notice how it is one part of the totality of the Toledot of the three brothers. So already here, the function is different. And the Toledot of Shem, the way we have learned, unfortunately, it took us time, but hopefully we arrived by now to understand that the Gospel of Mark is the Gospel of Mark. The Gospel of Luke is the Gospel of Luke. And the Gospel of Matthew is the Gospel of Matthew. You cannot mix and match. And my most forceful example is how the people run to assume that the three stories of the transfiguration are the same, where Luke is very different. And I mention this because the corollary of that is that the people jump immediately to assume that the temptation of Christ took place in Gethsemane. But Gethsemane is only in Mark and Matthew. In Luke, 
It is the Mount of Olives. I know later how they historicized it, and that's why when you go to Palestine, they show you that the Gethsemane is the But uh, <laughs> this is made up later. Why? Then your last step will be to realize that the Mount of Olives has a special place in the Gospel of Luke. So, sorry for the expansion, because really we have to grasp completely what I'm trying to channel here. That you hear the story on its own ground, and then you see what the author is doing with that. And that's why I began with Peleg and Yoktan. Yoktan disappears, although he sounds more important, and Peleg remains. Eber is definitely a very important word, name, as important as Shem, because of the rest of the story. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network.